He wanted to erect buildings more splendid, more beautiful, and larger than any that had ever been built before. But he hadn't seen, or so he later said, the blood on the hands of his Führer. He wanted to produce weapons that were more powerful, more deadly and more numerous than in any other war before. But he hadn't seen, or so he later said, the catastrophe his commander brought upon Germany and the whole world. He did it all for Adolf Hitler who, so he later said, had but one friend, him, Albert Speer. Berlin, 1930. Albert Speer, aged 25, and his wife Margaret enjoying life in the metropolis. They were happy to have escaped the provincialism of their hometown of Mannheim. The Technical University. Albert Speer studied architecture here at the urging of his father a wealthy Mannheim architect. His son would rather have been a mathematician. After graduating, Speer got a position as tutor at the university. He was lucky. Most of his fellow students joined the queues at the employment office. In the depths of the depression, the newly qualified stood no chance of finding work. In the atrium of the technical university, Political rallies were an almost daily occurrence. The university was a stronghold of the National Socialists. In Speer's faculty, two-thirds of all the students voted for them. Early December 1930, Der Angriff, the newspaper of the Berlin National Socialists, announced that Hitler would address a rally for students. Demonstrations greeted the Nazi Führer on his arrival in Berlin. Colleagues took Speer along to the New World, a beer hall in the blue-collar district of Neukölln. Despite the demonstrations, Hitler turned up on the evening of December the 5th. Somewhere in the crowded hall sat Albert Speer. He listened to the speech. There was no ranting. When Hitler talked about art, his delivery was deceptively sweet. Later, Speer was to say that he had been captivated by the magic of Hitler's voice. Speer was excited. Hitler's words had struck a chord with him. Three months later, Albert Speer joined the National Socialists and started to work for them. But not as a bully boy of the SA. He was interested, or so he later said, in the new tasks that would come with Hitler. Speer knew the fanatical politician was also a frustrated architect. But it was Goebbels, the Gauleiter of Berlin, who, in 1932, gave him his first small job as an architect. Speer was asked to renovate the Gauhaus in Foss Street. His designs matched the fast-growing party's need for a grand headquarters for official occasions. Goebbels was satisfied. A unique photo of the opening ceremony. Speer, who later claimed that he was just going along with things at this stage, was already somebody in the Berlin Nazi party. Hitler had only been in power for a few weeks when Speer got his big chance. 
On May the 1st, 1933, thousands of people from all over Germany marched to the Tempelhof field in Berlin. At its first mass rally, the new regime wanted to demonstrate its power and intimidate its opponents. Goebbels had given Speer the job of designing the parade ground. His plans have survived. Somewhat embarrassed, the hitherto unknown architect explained the concept in his first radio interview. So stark ausgestaltet wird, dass er auch von dem entferntesten Menschen, der an der Kundgebung teilnimmt, als äh, besonders wirkungsvoll empfunden wird. To make the Führer look particularly impressive, this mission now obsessed Speer, and Hitler was thrilled with Speer's ideas. Goebbels made the young architect official director of artistic organization of mass rallies, in other words, stage manager of the dictatorship. Building itself, however, was the domain of Professor Paul Ludwig Trost, Hitler's architect. Hitler admired Trost, but Trost regarded Hitler as a mere pupil. The Führer, however, wanted to be an architect himself. In the 20s, Hitler had sketched the monumental buildings of his future Reich. They were then castles in the air, but now he had a chance to turn them into reality. Hitler, the great builder, set to work. He needed a talented young architect, someone he could shape to his own goals, someone like Speer. Speer was still in the background, but he didn't have long to wait. In January 1934, Trost died. Speer, who had not yet designed a single building, became the first architect of the Führer. A phenomenal rise to power. A few days before the party rally in 1936, Hitler inspecting the site. Hitler was reportedly overwhelmed when his architect demonstrated the effects of his new stage. setting, night and searchlights. Speer, the master of ceremonies, could create every effect. Wagner. The overture to Rienzi, Hitler's favorite opera. The high point was the Cathedral of Light. To the end of his days, Speer was to call it his masterpiece. Only an illusion, but it lit up the sky. That was just the beginning. Speer's greatest project in Nuremberg was the National Stadium. It was designed to hold 400,000 spectators and be home to the Olympic Games. In future, they would always take place in Germany, or so Hitler said on the building site. Only the shell of the Congress Hall was finished before the beginning of the war. It was the only one of the Nuremberg buildings that Speer did not design himself, though he supervised its construction. It was built exclusively for Hitler's annual speech to the 50,000 delegates at the party rally. When the roof went on, the great builder declared, Man hat aber den Kampf von jedenfalls die Baumeister gegeben, die dafür sorgen werden, dass der Erfolg dieses Kampfes seine unvergängliche Erhaltung findet in den Dokumenten einer einmaligen großen Kunst. Deshalb sollen diese Bauwerke nicht gedacht sein für das Jahr 1940, auch nicht für das Jahr 2000, sondern sie sollen hineinragen gleich den Dom in unserer Vergangenheit in die Jahrtausende der Zukunft. 
Speer instituted a special construction process for the Nuremberg buildings, the Law of Ruins. The buildings were designed to look grand, even in a state of decay, like a temple of antiquity. Hitler liked to have his architect Speer with him on the Obersalzberg in Berchtesgaden as well. Speer and his wife Margaret belonged to Hitler's private circle. They were regular visitors to the Berghof. Speer built himself a studio on the Obersalzberg. It was here that Hitler told him about the greatest commission of all time, comparable, he said, only with the building of Babylon and ancient Egypt. Speer was to build Germania, the world's greatest capital city. In early 1937, Hitler appointed Speer Inspector General of Buildings for the renovation of the Reich capital and awarded him the title of professor. Speer's first project in Berlin, the new Reich Chancellery. The order to start work was given in January 1938. It had to be finished within the year because Hitler wanted to impress foreign ambassadors with the might of the new Greater German Reich at the next New Year's reception. Speer was put to the test. Now he had to show just what he could do. He was a great organizer, and so he didn't have one firm beauftragt with the Robo, but he had three, four or five firms beauftragt, beauftragt so that he das gleichzeitig an verschiedenen Stellen angefangen wurde zu bauen. Nur dadurch war es überhaupt möglich, dieses Objekt, dieses Riesenobjekt innerhalb von der kurzen Zeit zu bauen. The last stage. Over 8,000 workers were on the site at the same time. Speer wanted to hand over his building to the Führer on time. Only the finest materials from all over Europe were used and the best craftspeople in the Reich. Two days before the completion date, a tour of the rooms. Everything was ready. Hitler publicly called his architect a genius for the first time. The mosaic room, the long hall, Hitler's study. Speer designed the desk himself. Speer made a point of noting that all his plans had been based on the Führer's ideas. The Brandenburg Gate. Next to it, the new center of the Reich was to have been built. This is how it would have looked. The Great Square dominated by the Great Hall where 150,000 people could meet, the largest building in the world. Tiny by comparison, the old Reichstag. The high command of the Wehrmacht. The Führer's palace, much larger than the new Reich Chancellery. Hitler wanted delegations from subjugated peoples to come once a year to see and marvel. The lunacy of Germania was to be ready by 1950. The beginning was ordinary enough. In June 1938, the master of Germania displayed himself in his favorite pose as the great builder. Zum Neubau des Hauses des Fremdenverkehrs in Berlin und befehle damit zugleich den Beginn der Arbeit des Umbaus von Groß-Berlin. First, the Inspector General had to make space for the Führer's buildings. 52,000 flats needed to be demolished. 
To the people who lost their dwellings, Speer could offer a replacement. Over 23,000 so-called Jews' flats were registered by Speer's officials and rented to Aryans once they became available. Speer, who later claimed he knew nothing of this, threatened the landlords. It is a punishable offence to let a Jews' flat without my permission. Even from the Obersalzberg, Speer sent messages inquiring about progress with the eviction of Jewish tenants from a thousand apartments. House by house, the Gestapo and Speer's officials combed the city for flats. With German thoroughness, they drew up eviction lists and recorded the names and addresses of all Jewish tenants and the Aryans who were to take their place. The night before Hitler's 50th birthday in 1939, another show staged by Albert Speer. Am Vorabend des Geburtstages übergibt der Generalbauinspektor für die Reichshauptstadt, Professor Speer, dem Führer die fertiggestellte Ost-West-Achse. Vom großen Stern grüßt die neu erstandene Siegessäule. Speer made the deadline again. He even had a special present for the Führer. It was waiting in the Reich Chancellery. Hitler left a group of well-wishers. He was deeply moved. Here it was, a four-meter-high model of his Arch of Triumph. He'd sketched it 15 years earlier, and now Speer wanted to build it for him. Hitler is said to have spent half the night in front of this model. Indeed, there seemed to be no end to his triumphs. The 28th of June, 1940, Hitler the victor in Paris. He celebrated the moment of his greatest triumph with an early morning tour of the town in the company of his master builder. Hitler had thought of destroying Paris. Now, he wanted to leave the vanquished city as it was, so it would look small and pitiful next to Speer's new Berlin. While he was in Paris, Hitler gave the order, Berlin must soon be a monument to our victory. I see that as my most important contribution to the final establishment of our victory. But the war went on, on more and more fronts. One person knew this war could no longer be won. Dr. Fritz Taut, one of the earliest members of the National Socialists and a devoted follower of Hitler. The Tod organization built Hitler his autobahns and the West Wall, known to the Allies as the Siegfried Line. From the beginning of the war, Tod was minister for armaments and munitions. Tod thought the war on two fronts against the Soviet Union and the Allies was disastrous. He urged Hitler to make peace before the tide turned against Germany. The Supreme Commander wouldn't hear of it. The 7th of February, 1942, the Führer's headquarters at the Wolf's Lair. Again, Tord tried to convince Hitler of the seriousness of the situation, but he knew his efforts had been in vain. The following morning, Tord boarded a plane for Berlin. The plane crashed shortly after takeoff. The cause of the crash was never discovered. Speer's time had come again. Once more, it followed a death.
the new armaments minister marched at the head of the funeral cortege. Speer and Hitler, a new chapter in their relationship. It started with a solemn oath. Paying his respects in his new role, Speer promised an armaments miracle. Hitler gave his minister free reign, just as he had to Speer as an architect. Meeting of the German armaments industry with the head of the Wehrmacht. Speer's first appearance as minister. His goal, to reorganize armaments production. The program he introduced was based on the self-responsibility of industry. He had no time for bureaucracy. Speer's new weapons were to be sent straight to the front. The minister requested and supported open discussion. Many of his colleagues were not even party members. He made just one demand, the immediate increase of armaments production. Speer's demand was met. After just six months in office, Hitler's dynamic new minister reviewed the figures before representatives of German industry. Dass die Ansprüche des Führers an die Rüstungswirtschaft hoch und die von ihm verlangten Lieferungen daher nur äußerst schwer zu erreichen sind. Es hat sich von Monat zu Monat steigen das unerwartete Bild ergeben, dass diese vom Führer verlangten Zahlen nicht nur erreicht, sondern immer mehr übertroffen wurden. Die letzte Meldung. Er gab nirgendwo einen Minderausstoß, fast überall eine Mehrlieferung von einem Drittel bis zur Hälfte und auf einigen wichtigsten Gebieten sogar eine Verdopplung der vom Führer ursprünglich verlangten und erwarteten Leistungen. Speer had shown what he could do. As a student, he had shown his father. Now, as a minister, he was showing the Führer. Speer enjoyed the power his association with Hitler brought him. He was intoxicated by power, as he later put it. Hitler promised him that once they'd won the war, they would just build. It was as an architect that Speer wanted to go down in history. But despite all Speer's efforts, the tide turned at the front. In the winter of 42 to 43, the Wehrmacht suffered major defeats in Africa and Russia. Enormous quantities of arms and munitions were lost. 100,000 German soldiers fell in battle. At Stalingrad, an entire army was obliterated. The Wehrmacht asked Speer for 700,000 factory workers as troops. Speer reacted with mobilization of the labor force the protected firms. Previously, anyone who worked here was in a reserved occupation. Now, skilled workers and engineers were conscripted into the army from key German armaments factories. Speer had to fill the gap, so women were sent to the armaments front. Hitler demanded deployment of concentration camp inmates, prisoners of war and forced laborers. Speer later protested that he'd had nothing to do with that, which we now know to be untrue. After inspecting a concentration camp, Speer, for whom Hitler's palaces could never be grand enough, wrote to his dear party comrade Himmler that the SS should use more primitive building methods because the hut struck him as overly generous. <laughs> Back home, Speer drummed up support with his national comrades for the total war industry. 
His most important ally, Propaganda Minister Goebbels. The two of them began to appear together more and more. Der Führer erwartet, dass der Heimat kein Opfer zu groß ist, wenn es gilt, dem Frontsoldaten neue Waffen zu schmieden. Wir geloben unseren Soldaten an der Front, auch weiter nicht nur unsere Pflicht zu tun, sondern das Äußerste an Arbeitsleistung zu vollbringen und von Monat zu Monat unsere Produktion stetig zu steigern. Hitler pinned all his hopes on Speer. In return, Speer got what he wanted most, the Führer's gratitude. Hitler now ended conversations with his armaments minister, Heil Speer, a likely successor. Speer was now an architect of armaments. The men pored over plans and construction models. It looked just like the old days. But there was one difference this time. Hitler had fought in the First World War. Speer hadn't. Hitler was giving all the orders now. This hierarchical shift was to have one far-reaching consequence. German rockets had been tested at Peenemünde on the island of Usedom for several years. Speer favored anti-aircraft rockets. They were small, cheap, and were urgently needed to counter the Allied bombers, which were flying ever higher and ever faster. Hitler preferred the V-2 assault rocket, which was big and expensive. Speer was won over to Hitler's position. The psychological effect of the V-2 fascinated the two comrades in art. The V-2 turned out to be extremely unreliable. It was Speer's greatest flop, as useless as the monumental buildings in Berlin and Nuremberg. Dora Mittelbau concentration camp. A system of tunnels in the Harz Mountains was turned into a factory for miracle weapons. The Führer ordered Speer to use labor from the concentration camps. With 20 kilometers of tunnels, it was the largest underground factory in the world. From 1943 on, 60,000 slaves toiled in these dungeons for the final victory. One in three did not survive. The suffering of those days is barely imaginable now. Da sind, da haben sie gebohrt, geschossen, gesprengt. Licht war immer nie ausgegangen. Äh, Elfen haben geschlagen. Und warum? Jede Kleinigkeit. Und derjenige, der geschlafen hat, der konnte auch nicht schlafen. Weil der andere geschrien hat, immer 25 äh, Stockliebe, Gummiklippe. Und die Häftlinge, oh, ja, 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 Und ich habe zum Glück nur sieben Stecke gekriegt, die ganzen. Aber viele haben gekriegt, 25, oder haben sie auch gehen. At the end of 1943, Speer came for an inspection. Barbaric, he said. Inhuman conditions, he said. Later. Zwölf Stunden im Stollen und nur arbeiten. Mitunter nachts auch gearbeitet. Also Schichten mussten dann gemacht werden. Äh, die Nazis wollten ja den Krieg noch gewinnen mit dieser Waffe. Dann hat man an Häftlingen alles reingeschoben, was nur ging. Wer nicht konnte, der wurde erschossen oder die Transporte gingen wieder ab zurück nach dem anderen Lager. Dort sind sie dann äh, umgekommen und hat wieder neue Häftlinge angefordert. Es kann ein Außenstehender sich gar nicht vorstellen, was hier geschehen ist. Darum sage ich, und es ist auch so gewesen, für mich war das das schlimmste Lager. Durch Arbeit wurden die Häftlinge die Menschen kaputt gemacht. While the first prisoners were being transported to Dora, the Reich leaders and Gauleiters of the Nazi Party gathered here in Posen Castle on October the 6th, 1943, a crisis meeting. Speer wanted to stop all civilian production at once, but the Gauleiters were afraid of a change of mood in Germany. Furious, 
Speer gave Hitler's old guard an ultimatum. Ich bitte Sie nur eins zur Kenntnis zu nehmen. Die bisherige Art, nach der einzelne Gaue sich von Stilllegungen ausgenommen haben, kann und wird nicht mehr am Platze sein. Ich werde daher die Stilllegungen, soweit nicht die Gaue innerhalb von 14 Tagen meiner Aufforderung zur Stilllegung nachkommen, selbst aussprechen und ich kann Ihnen versichern, dass ich hier gewillt bin, die Autorität des Reiches durchzusetzen, koste es, was es kostet. Ich habe mit Reichsführer S. Himmler gesprochen und ich werde diejenigen GAU, die hier nun diese Maßnahmen nicht durchführen, entsprechend behandeln. After Speer, it was Himmler's turn. His topic, the final solution of the Jewish question. Not one political leader of the Third Reich should have been able to say later that he hadn't known about it. Speer, however, later maintained he hadn't been present during Himmler's speech. He had left early to join Hitler. As if to flee from the awful truth about Hitler's regime and the nation's impending defeat, Speer threw himself into frantic traveling. The Junkers 52 became his second home. Unlike Hitler, Speer constantly traveled to the hot spots of the war. He listened to the soldiers and from them learned the real truth about how grim the situation was. Speer was fascinated by his toys, new weapons. All his energy went into their development. His six children practically never saw their father. They later said they'd grown up without a father. Speer spread optimism in the factories, although he knew the country's reserves had been used up. The conflict between what he thought and what he did made him ill. The SS clinic, Hohenlüchen, north of Berlin, Speer's official residence from January 1944. A feverish inflammation of the knee led to a pulmonary embolism. Hitler sent the best doctors of the Reich to save his henchman's life. But Speer was isolated from his master. His opponents spread rumors that Hitler blamed Speer for the reversals at the front and was even considering replacing him. From hospital, Speer lamented in a letter to Hitler, Mein Führer, this is the first time you have been displeased with any achievements in my domain. Speer felt rejected and offered to resign. Hitler had a messenger sent to the hospital. Tell Speer he's very dear to me. In May 1944, Speer returned to office fully recovered. But his armaments empire was under dire threat. The Allies ruled the airspace over Germany. Almost unopposed, thousands of flying fortresses took off daily for Germany. The American 8th Air Force concentrated on destroying the German armaments industry. In May 44, they were given a mission which had a decisive impact on the course of the war. Their target? The Leuna works in Merseburg. Here, synthetic petrol was made from coal. After the loss of the oil fields in Romania, Leuna was the Wehrmacht's last major source of energy. The next day, 145 tons are released on synthetic oil plants in the famous Leuna ammonia and nitrogen... The bombers of the American 8th Air Force attacked the German fuel plants almost continually. Finally, 90% of German aircraft fuel production was destroyed. Speer sent a memorandum to Hitler with an urgent plea for protection and rebuilding of the fuel plants. A shortage of aircraft fuel loomed, with disastrous consequences for the Wehrmacht. But Hitler only wanted to hear good news. The Reich Minister for Armaments and Munitions did his best as always and presented his commander with ever larger, ever more powerful weapons. <laughs> 
In the middle of 1944, the minister was able to report a new peak in armaments production. Speer prolonged Hitler's war, long since a lost cause, by months. November 1944. The Americans crossed the German Western Front and took Aachen. The armaments factories along the Ruhr were now on the front and under threat. Speer set off on one of his journeys of inspection in the winter of 44 to 45, journeys to the combat zone. Speer realized the war was lost. He started to make plans for the period after Hitler, playing a double game. Speer was not yet 40 and intended to play a part after the war. Not wanting to face the victors empty-handed, he aimed to leave German industry as intact as possible. But at the front, everything was being blown up in the retreat. Speer urged Hitler not to destroy the factories in the West above all, but just to cripple them temporarily. Das war ja die Kunst von Speer, dass er das überbrückte bei Hitler und das ist ja ein Beispiel für das, was ich schon gesagt habe, dass er nicht nachließ, Dinge, die er durchsetzen wollte, immer wieder in anderer Form zu unterbreiten und dadurch, dass er Hitler sagte, wenn wir das aber zurückerobern und das war das, was Hitler am liebsten hören wollte, dann müssen wir ja doch den Betrieb wieder in Ordnung bringen können und dann lähmen wir ihn doch. Und das war, da war er einverstanden. Or he agreed until March the 19th, 1945. In this teletype message, Hitler called for application of the scorched earth principle. All industrial plant that could be of use to the enemy was to be destroyed. Speer's adjutant saw his reaction at close quarters. Er war, er war wütend, echt wütend. Also er war nicht in dem Sinne verzweifelt, dass er aufgab, sondern er war wütend und die Reaktion war, ich muss was dagegen tun. Speer broke off his journey and raced back to Berlin. In his luggage was a handwritten letter to Hitler. Mein Führer, my belief that our fate would change for the better was unshaken until March the 18th. I cannot believe in the success of our just cause if we destroy the foundations of our national existence in these decisive months. I therefore beg you not to carry out this measure which will be so destructive to the people. May God protect Germany. Speer. A refusal to obey orders and an open criticism of Hitler in those days, many thousands of people were killed for that. Speer, however, was received in the Reich Chancellery. He reaffirmed his loyalty to the Führer. It was the price he paid for the free hand Hitler gave him. It was Hitler's farewell from the man who would later say, if Hitler ever had a friend, it would have been me. Three weeks later, on April the 21st, 1945, Speer left Berlin and headed north. He thought his alliance with the man who had defined his life for 15 years was now over. In Mecklenburg, Speer wanted to prepare for the new tasks he hoped were in store for him in the period after Hitler. Two days later, on April the 23rd, events took a dramatic turn. On a Luftwaffe base in Mecklenburg, a light plane was made ready for takeoff. The passenger, Albert Speer. The destination of the Fiesler Stork, Berlin.
Why did Speer fly back to the besieged city? On board with him was Adjutant von Posa. He now breaks his silence. Meine Begriffe muss es einen guten Grund geben, aus dem Speer nach Berlin flog. Ich bin der Auffassung, dass etwas dahinter stecken musste, was ihn so bewegte, dass er den Flug für notwendig hielt. Dafür wäre etwa in Frage gekommen, dass er Sorge hatte, Nachfolger von Hitler zu werden. Das hätte ihn zusätzlich belastet, sei es bei dem Urteil, was ja damals noch gar nicht heraus feststand in Nürnberg, oder sei es bei der späteren äh, Inanspruchnahme für den Wiederaufbau in Deutschland, womit er ja damals noch rechnete. Fear of being made Hitler's successor? Was it that which drove Speer back to the Reich Chancellery, to the place he later called the ruins of my life? To the thunder of artillery fire, he made his way down into the Führer's bunker for the last time. Ich erinnere mich, er ist dann äh, in, ins Arbeitszimmer mit dem Führer und die haben ein langes Gespräch miteinander noch gehabt. Und dann ist aber Speer wieder weg und das war das letzte Mal, dass er da war. Was da passiert ist, Hitler hat auch nachher nicht mehr über Speer gesprochen. After taking his leave of Hitler, Speer crept back through the catacombs of Berlin's government district to his airplane. His adventure paid off. Hitler left Dönitz, not Speer, the responsibility for the country he had led to ruin. Speer was not mentioned in Hitler's last will and testament. On May the 3rd, the man who believed he had been given a second chance addressed the nation from the Hamburg radio studio. Das deutsche Volk hat in diesem Kriege eine geschlossene Haltung gezeigt, die in einer späteren Zukunft die Bewunderung einer gerechten Geschichte hervorrufen wird. Wir dürfen gerade in diesem Augenblick nicht trauern und Vergangenen nachweinen. Nur durch verbissene Arbeit lässt sich unser Los weitertragen. One year later, Speer was the only defendant at the Nuremberg trial to accept a collective responsibility for the deeds of the man to whom he had sold his soul. About the crimes of the regime, however, he claimed to the end of his life to have had no knowledge. The court sentenced him to 20 years imprisonment. He was released in 1966. Albert Speer died in London in 1981.